James Hardy Vaughan was born in Surrey, England, around the year 1782. His father, Hardy Vaughan, was a butler and house steward. He worked for George Holm Sumner, a Tory member of Parliament, and the owner at the time of Hatchlands Park. James's mother came from a good family, as her father was an attorney. James had a good upbringing, going to a boarding school and spending most of his early life with his grandparents in Shropshire, England. By the time he was 14, James was bored of being in school. He asked his grandfather if he could get an apprenticeship, and within a few months, he became an apprentice linen draper in Liverpool. When he started working, he was very well behaved, avoiding trouble and following his master's every order. However, after just a few months, his attitude changed. He began to stay up late, drinking in the city's taverns, mixing with all sorts of people. Then, he started to go to cockfights during his breaks and after work. Eventually, he got so involved in his new lifestyle that he started to neglect his duties. He would frequently leave work for hours so he could bet on cockfights and drink. His betting wasn't going well and his debts started to pile up. In order to continue betting and going on nights out, he started to steal money from his employer. Fortunately for Vol, his master never found out about his stealing, but he sacked him anyway as he disapproved of his new attitude and bad work habits. Following this, he moved to London and found the job as a clerk. He wasn't very interested in the job, but it was the only way he could maintain his new lifestyle. It wasn't long until nights out in taverns turned into spending evenings with prostitutes. Vol found out about the red light district in Covent Garden, which was very near to his work. At this point, he had fully embraced a life of drinking and whoring. Soon, he grew tired of his lifestyle and left his job as a clerk. By now he was 16 and was in and out of jobs, looking for some discipline as his life wasn't going in the right direction. In 1798, Vol joined the Navy and served on the ship HMS Astrea. He soon realised it wasn't the life he wanted, and a year later, he deserted the ship and managed to return to London. Now in London, and with no job, he began to mix with more shady characters from the city's underworld. To survive, he started to steal, and within the year, he had turned himself into a professional thief and swindler. His technique involved buying goods on credit from various tradesmen and not paying. He tricked the traders into believing that he would pay, but his true intention was to flee with the items without paying a penny. He did a similar thing when it came to lodgings. He would grab all his things during the middle of the night and leave. This way he avoided paying rent and said clear of tradesmen that he had swindled. While doing this, he started doing odd jobs and gained the trust of his employers. Once he felt he was sufficiently trusted, he would steal money from them and flee. On top of this, he would somehow convince people to donate him money, albeit small amounts. Eventually, his imperfect schemes caught up to him. In April of 1800, he was arrested after he tried to get away with stealing from his employer. Fortunately, he was never convicted and got away with his actions. A few months later, he was arrested again for pickpocketing a handkerchief. He was tried for robbery at the Old Bailey and found guilty. For stealing the handkerchief, he was sentenced to seven years transportation. Back in the 1800s, the sentence of transportation involved a five month journey to the penal colony of New South Wales. Before departure, convicts were washed, clothed, and divided into groups. Each person received bedding and utensils, and everybody was assigned a role. Conditions on board were rough and unhygienic. Many convicts died of illness during the journey, especially those who were weak before departure. After a long, demanding journey, Vol arrived in Sydney aboard the convict ship Minorca in December 1801. Once there, again he got the job as a clerk in Hawkesbury. After that, he managed to get a better position, finding work at the Colonial Secretary's office in Sydney. Despite having secured a decent job, he betrayed his boss, trying to forge the initials of the Governor King. 
he tried to give orders to the local administration that would secure his return to London, but he was discovered and punished. Along with other convicts, he was forced to do hard labour in dreadful conditions. Eventually, he finished his punishment and managed to restore his reputation in New South Wales. Again, he started to work as a clerk, this time to a magistrate in Parramatta. After a year of working, his sentence was about to finish. In 1807, he helped the Governor King organise his papers for his voyage to London. For doing him this favour, he granted Vo a job on the HMS Buffalo. All Vo had to do was document the Governor's journey back to England. While on the ship, his sentence of seven years ran out. Vo started to disobey the demands of his superiors, and he was forced to enlist as a seaman. Vo disliked being a seaman, he wanted to be free. So, he deserted the ship once it arrived in Portsmouth. Living in London with no job, he recommenced his illegal activities. This time, he tried a new, less obvious strategy, as he had previously been caught thieving. He dressed and acted like a gentleman. This way, less people would question his actions and would generally give him the benefit of the doubt. In his nice clothes, he entered many jewellers' shops, and while no one was looking, he pocketed expensive chains, watches, and rings. He committed these robberies in shops all around London for various months. Eventually, law and order caught up to him. He was arrested in November 1808 and put on trial for stealing an ornaments box. Luckily for Vol, there wasn't enough evidence to link him to the crime, and he escaped being resentenced. Nevertheless, his good fortune came to an end when he was arrested yet another time and tried for robbery at the Old Bailey. He was charged for stealing three diamond rings and a brooch. At the time, this was a capital offence. In February 1809, the court decided that James Hardy Vaux was to be sentenced to death, but later his sentence was reduced to transportation for life. Vaux was transported on the convict ship Indian. On board, conditions were miserable and unhygienic. Finally, in December 1810, the ship made it to Sydney. Once there, he was assigned work, first to aid a man settling in Hawkesbury, and later to oversee a convict gang in Sydney. However, even in the penal colony, his illegal dealings continued. In 1811, he received stolen property and was caught. Because of this, he was banished to Newcastle Penal Settlement. In 1814, he made an attempt to escape by trying to board a ship leaving the settlement. His efforts were in vain. He was caught, beaten, and returned to the settlement. During his time in the penal settlement, Wolf started to write a dictionary. His work consisted of a slang or flash dictionary for the use of magistrates. During this, he started to write his memoirs thanks to the encouragement from a man named Captain Thompson. He titled his work, Memoirs of the First 32 Years of the Life of James Hardy Vaux, a Swindler and Pickpocket, now transported for the second time and for life to New South Wales. In 1819, the manuscripts of both his works came into the possession of Baron Field. With the help of John Murray, they published Vaux's writings in London. The memoirs were republished in 1827 and then reprinted in 1829 and 1830. From this, Vaux received just over £30 in royalties. His memoirs are considered to be the first complete autobiography written in Australia, and his work, Vocabulary of the Flash Language, the first dictionary compiled in Australia. In 1820, Vaux received a conditional pardon. This meant that he could leave the penal settlement in Newcastle, but he was still required to stay in New South Wales. Until 1826, he was living a decent life, working as a clerk in the colonial secretary's office. However, he was dismissed without any notice. The policy of not employing convicts 
had never been applied, but it was decided that his past was shameful and that he should never have been working there in the first place. Evidently, Vol was extremely disappointed and infuriated, as he considered the sacking to be totally absurd. He did manage to find more jobs available to him, but nothing of the same standard. For nine years, Vol had lived honestly, but after three years of rejection due to his past, he decided to break the terms of his pardon. He escaped New South Wales in April 1829. Vol made it to Ireland and roamed Dublin under the alias James Young. Instead of restarting his life, he went back to his criminal ways and hoped to get money through illegal means. After only a few months in Dublin, he was imprisoned for using forged banknotes. Before his trial, he sent a message to the bank asking for them to be lenient. Vo was found guilty, but thanks to his letter, he was only sentenced to transportation for seven years. This was now the third time that he had made the unpleasant journey to New South Wales. In May 1831, the convict ship Waterloo arrived in Sydney. Within days, they recognised Vo as the escaped convict from around two years ago. His life sentence was reinstated and he was sent to Port Macquarie Penal Settlement. In 1837, he returned to Sydney and found a job as a clerk to a wine merchant. Two years later, he was put behind bars for an assault on a young girl aged around eight. The details behind the attack are unknown. He was released from prison in 1841. By now, he was 59 years old. To date, there's no reliable record of what happened to Vol after 1841. The remainder of his life and death are a complete mystery. Vol is the only person on record to have been transported to New South Wales three times, but it's very likely that he was not the only criminal to have done this. Vol wasn't an accomplished criminal. In actual fact, he was a complete failure. However, what makes Vol stand out is his literary ability. His dictionary gives us an insight into London slang from the early 19th century, and his memoirs accurately portray the criminal life in London and the English penal system. Thank you to everyone for watching this video on James Hardy Vol. I really hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please leave a like and a comment. And if you're new to the channel, why not subscribe? That will be all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.